Right, so this is where we get to the fun part. Um, do you guys want to come back up? Wherever you are, there you are. Yeah. Rob. Um, so this is almost a free for all with um, <laughs> a, couple, a couple of ground rules. <laughs> we just swap. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask you to do a few things. If you guys have problems with your existing storage environment, can you not, not mention not mention who your storage vendor is? This isn't meant to be about um, a bash. We're trying to encourage. You can mention yours, Chris. It's fine. <laughs> not my time here. We are very much trying to highlight what these guys can do for you and what the benefits of their stuff is rather than um, trying to talk about what other people aren't doing. And even if you get, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this out now. If anybody says, what's the best storage to use for my environment and just leaves it at that, you're not allowed to come in and have any beer whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> you're getting kicked out. Can, can I ask you a question of Phil? Yes. No. The, the, the it's 30 day money back guarantee. Yes. Thing. Yes. Are we going to see Vaughan Stewart do a sham wow ad, you know, something like that? <laughs> it's kind of sure, because his latest video, he's got to be able to do something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A gorilla <laughs> something. <laughs> he's All right. doing some interesting video. Yeah, yeah. challenge me. I said, yeah. sham wow. Yeah, I'll go. Yeah. Being we're thinking about buying yeah. pure, can we have one in the lab for 30 days, and if we're not happy, we'll... <laughs> yeah, we'll evaluate right. it again for another 30 days. Who wants to go first? It'll be a rolling oh. e for Adam. Yeah. All right. Um, I've pretty much got a question for all of you. Um, I'll start with Phil. So Forever Flash, you can do um, in-place controller upgrades. What about the disk shelves themselves? Uh, yes, absolutely. You can add uh, you can add disk shelves today, non-disruptively. So if, um, if, for instance, you buy three disk shelves today and you've got your two controllers, the three and uh, hit their end of um, support. Yeah. How do we do in-place with that? So look, that feature's not there now because we haven't had any requirements for for injecting, but. What you'll see is, and, and the way we're actually positioning this is, flash is going to evolve and you're going to see denser flash and you're going to actually see, you're probably going to see SSD drives disappear, right? Um, the form factor is there because that's the most common form factor to use. Um, our take is, is that at some particular point, yes, those drive tapes will be removed um, because it's no longer cost effective to actually have them in there. And yes, you will be able to remove them online. Look at this. At this point, you can't, but that is happening right now. I mean, it's called an inject, uh, uh, injection or de-injection, not calling it. Yeah. Um, next question for Josh. So, uh, resiliency, <laughs> resiliency in the in the nodes and node failure. How does because you're using the VM controller? Um, how do you deal with things like um, overcommit of the host? Yeah, sure. Good question. So, I think the most important thing is that we scale out. So in the event that one controller, let's say you've overcommitted your host, you've turned off admission control, you've overcommitted 500% on business critical workloads, then you've only impacted that host. So worst case scenario. We do use reservations for memory um, as well as CPU, um, which is not a perfect fix to be honest. CPU reservations don't solve every level of contention, but the idea is scaling out. So if you get impact, it's only impacting one node. Okay, so the VMs on that node would potentially be affected if you... Yeah, you can potentially overcommit too much, yeah. just like in any vSphere environment. Yeah. Next question for Greg. Mm -hmm. um, vSAN 1.0, understand, um, but you're sort of saying from Tier 2 apps, um, avoiding the Tier 1 apps, what do you classify as a Tier 1 app and what's a Tier 2 app? Yeah, so um, I, was, I was watching something recently where the guy kept saying to every person who asked the question, that's a good question. And he said, that just sounds like total crap after a while. So then every person, yeah. and he said, I don't really mean that when I say good question. So everyone who asked him a good a question after that, he'd go, that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> so good question. Um, yeah, look, it's a, it's a um, I, I guess from our perspective, the definition of, of it, it's, it's very difficult to put an application in a tier, if that makes sense. Because from my, from my perspective, an application is tiered not only based on what it is and its profile of how it reads, writes, all that sort of stuff, but the use that it's actually being doing. So if I'm if I install SQL as a as a you know as a testing environment because I want to run some some you know um, transact SQL testing or something like that, which is very low impact to me, you know, not a tier one app, right? But if I install it as the production database, absolutely, it's a tier one app. So it's, it's almost realistically, for, for our perspective from a customer base, it's the use case as well as the app. Now, in 
specifically our tools that we have when we go into a customer site and we use the VMware Infrastructure Planner, that would actually spit out the workload profile of any of those particular applications and provide recommendations for VSAN and configs and things like that. So it's still that today. Awesome. So, so I can't give you an answer to say SQL or, or Oracle or SAP or whatever because in certain circumstances, um, depending on their workload profile, yeah, they might be, but depending on the use case, as in the size of, you know, like Damien, if he installs SQL, I'm sure we'd be able to handle that sort of a thing. If, you know, if, let's say, Sportsnet, for instance, are going to, you know, install SQL and run their entire, you know, workloads on, on SQL backends, uh, would we go after that straight away as our primary use case? No. Um, in future, will we? Absolutely. But at the moment, no, it's, it's just, we've got too much other stuff to, to get at um, with all of our customers um, at that particular, you know, with, with what we're doing at the moment to, to worry about that. Typical VMware answer, it depends. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, what would I be answer? No. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your <laughs> question. <laughs> It depends. Um, and <laughs> and um, Rob, just with, um, I did see Tim Tintry at VMworld and spoke to him, but um, I guess I know most of the guys in terms of their connectivity to these arrays. Yeah. Um, I guess if you could all just go over that, what connectivity is. For yeah, so that's, that's a pretty straightforward one. So in terms of connectivity for, uh, for VMware, it's uh, uh, NFS connectivity for, say, for Red Hat, it's the same NFS connectivity, um, and Hyper-V it's SMB3. So we don't use any file-based, uh, block-based protocols. We only use uh, file-based protocols, so. Yeah. yeah, we don't have any, as I said, we don't have any specific mount points. It's kernel code that mounts all the individual um, um, blobs, I guess, or, or objects, I guess, or not objects. Um, storage blobs from each of the nodes up and presents it as one specific data store. So there's nothing the customer sees, there's nothing the user sees. Um, there's really nothing you can, you can do with it. So there's no, no, no management of that. Thing. Yeah, so uh, the Nutanix uses NFS, iSCSI, or SMB3, and you can actually present the same storage via all those three protocols concurrently yep. to any hypervisor you like. So we are iSCSI and Fiber Channel, and uh, same thing, you can present and, and, and either way we actually support coexistence of both. Can I just ask a, a quick one on the back of that? So no, no file base, just block based today. Just block based today. All right, who's next? Any more? Or are we all looking for a beer? I'll go for a moment. Which recording is all trying to get to? Question for, uh, for Josh. Right at the be beginning of your presentation, you said that Nutanix scan or handle any, nearly any work, what can you not watch modes or handle? Yeah, well that is a great question. Time to use it. So look, to be honest, the, the workloads that we don't go after is where they're really scaled up. So if you've got a really, really large workload that wants to do a million IOPS or some insane number, we wouldn't recommend that workload. Um, so generally we tell customers that have a large Oracle deployment or a large SQL deployment, if you're over, say, 30, 40, 50,000 IOPS to actually scale that out in the application layer because we're all about scaling out and building resilience from scaling out rather than scaling up. So you have very, very large IOP workloads. Um, your friends over here might be able to help you with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that, that's actually a good point, I guess. Um, as I mean, I've worked with Rob before in the past and NetApp and, and Phil and, and Josh, I, I know. Um, <laughs> I don't like him, but I know him. Um, and, we, and, and not only us up on stage, but there's others in the room I know and, and a lot of other vendors I work with as well as part of VMware. I guess I'm realistic enough to know, and when, when people ask about you know, multi-hypervisor and all this sort of stuff, and I'm very clear about the positioning of what vSAN actually is for our market today. As I said, we've got 500,000 customers, 48 million VMs that run on vSpec. So, we think we've got a bit of work to try and get vSAN into our customers, you know, as, as of now. But in those sorts of scenarios, then obviously there's, a, there's all of us that have capabilities that can provide the customer. I think the, the thing that's going on in the storage industry at the moment is all of us trying to find gr good solutions, new technology, disruptive te technology, um, and, and functionality to bring the customers to make sure that we're delivering the right outcomes because 
you know, if, if we're not, some of us will be found out and, and things like that in, in time. So um, I'm more than happy, you know, as, as VMware to engage all of our storage partners that we've worked with for a long, long time. There's a whole bunch of new storage partners that VMware's got, which are obviously on stage. And, you know, there's multiple use cases, multiple ways. And sure, there's overlap with everything that we do. Uh, but that's the same in the networking space. It's the same in, the, in the, every other space that we, that we play. Right. So I guess um, from an architectural perspective, not from a vendor perspective, you need to look at your own requirements. So we talked about this workload that I said wouldn't be great for Nutanix, right? There's other platforms that can do that. So you really got to look at what the bulk of your requirements are. So if 80% of your requirements are really, really high IOPS, then maybe Nutanix isn't the best fit. But at the same token, if most of your workloads are fairly low, then maybe it's a great fit. So look at your own requirements, speak to all the vendors, don't just listen to me and believe me, um, just because I'm good looking, right? Speak to everyone else, and you know, really assess what your requirements are, and validate those things. It's a bit smelly Anyone else will have to start asking questions? Can you've I already had one solved, and you've already had one too. Oh. You know more, but if somebody else goes first, come on. Share the love. So, with the exponential growth of data, uh, what's the roadmap from each of the vendors on how to deal with cold data uh, beyond where duplicate, deduplication will help with rich media? You're talking just straight cold data? Yeah. Um, I guess, uh, we, well, you're going to see flash drop down below, down to starter prices, right? There's obviously that technology coming in. And um, at that particular point, um, it will move to Flash and move to the cloud. That's that's yeah. how I think yeah, I think yeah. absolutely. But I've kind of I've grabbed that, but it's just um. It's like you don't have to run. Yeah, you do the passing a lot. No, absolutely. Echo what, what, what Phil said here. We, we certainly see a trend um, around you know why keep why <coughs> keep cold data in your data center? Why why have the infrastructure there? Why have to manage it when you're just not accessing it very often? So. Yeah, we definitely see or starting to see a trend towards, you know, use you know, whatever cloud it is out there to, to put this stuff. Um, you know, it's going to be a fairly low cost in doing it and really just keeping your data center, your, you know, your active working sets, your high performance stuff that you need to deliver that performance. You know, things you can't put out in the cloud, but the you know, vast majority of stuff just, uh, you know, you don't really need to keep in your data centers anymore. Uh, is there any plans from any of you to actually plug into your, your systems to go out to the cloud to, to push it out? No, that's actually a really good question. Really good question. It's a really good one. Uh, yeah, look, I think probably most vendors are looking at it, but uh, Nutanix have got AWS and Azure um, integration coming in 4.0, which I don't know when it's GA, but it's a couple of months away. So yeah, we absolutely looked at that. And to your question about yeah, cold data, that's absolutely one of the use cases, um, as well as backups and things like that. But also being able to move the VM from on-premise to the cloud. But, so you know, VM's going to have 80% you know, of the start is not going to be accessed regularly. So how are, they gonna, how are you going to move those, just those blocks not accessed up to the cloud? And it begs the question too, what does the cloud use if they're not using your leading technologies? Yeah, I think your original question was, all cold data, I think. Well, you clarified so. Yeah, yeah. I suppose, yeah. So I'm talking about the cold data within your array, sorry, not yeah. Yeah, like all cold data that's sitting in your array. So every array that we have on the floor today is going to have some amount of cold data in it. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not talking about, you know, but like, yeah, how do we deal with that with these sorts of technologies? Like, is there a roadmap to be able to, you know, put that down to a cheaper commodity type mm -hmm. tin? Yeah, so I mean, Nutanix, we do SSD, HDD, and we tier between them based on what's active. Um, we also have storage heavy nodes, which are designed specifically for that type of data. So we have a lot of HDDs, you know, four terabyte large drives for that cold data. So yeah, we also compress and dedupe as well. So can I just, off the back of that, so to, to place this maybe a little bit more concretely for everybody in the room, um, in terms of scale, do we have some supported numbers that you guys can talk about in terms of the amount of storage, regardless of whether it's hot or cold, that you can actually support on your arrays? Just to give, I guess, everyone an idea of what that might look like before we need to look at other technologies. Right. I mean, I'll first I'll answer my, my question probably from Pure yes. right now. Um, do, do we have cold data? Um, and Josh really hit it. Like, I, I see now simplicity is, is what a lot of we are driving, right? which means you do have coexistence of vendors 
And there is a good fit. Not one vendor right now I think is always going to be a good fit. So where we fit well is, is as we mentioned, high performance applications that have zero performance or, or have zero um, uh, issue, or, or I'm just trying to think of the right term, um, has any impact on performance, that's where we fit. So our data will most likely be hot. In fact, we say we, we support very, very large working sets. So you probably won't see the cold data. I mean, we can support, I mean, I'll give you a rough figure. Um, today, uh, probably over 200 terabytes in a single, uh, in, uh, in uh, a single controller yeah. of flash, or flash. So depending on data rates, you know, what much you'll get out of that. I'm going to give you a really good it depends answer. Um, <laughs> because we don't have a limited number of nodes in the cluster, um, nor do we limit what you mix. So we actually don't really have a limit as such. Um, mathematically, it's somewhere in the exabytes. So. Yeah, I guess from a VMware perspective. Just, just play, playing the moderator flag for a moment. So, um, working, working for a vendor, we obviously have, there are certain things that are literally hard limits of what won't work, and there are other limits of what's been tested. Do you have any numbers of what's actually been tested or not? Yeah. Yeah? No. Yeah. Play <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah, look, we tested internally a 64 node cluster, uh, which was our. our 3,000 series, so I'm not sure what that adds up to, to be honest, off the top of my head. But uh, it would be roughly what would be four terabytes a node, so four by 64 is what we've tested internally, performance-wise as well. How about monster VMs? Sorry. How about monster VMs? If you have very large requirements for let's have a RAM, for example. Yeah. How do you handle sure. that? Um, so basically, it's limited by your node size. Um, so we've probably skipped off. Can, say, so can, we, can we just circle back on that one once the other guys have answered? Thanks. I think I forgot the question. Um, yeah, so ma maximum cluster, so for vSphere, obviously um, we have one data store, one vSAM data store per cluster. So the maximum cluster size, um, the maximum amount of disks per node is up to 35. So depending on the size and, and um, form factor of the, of the hard drives that you would get, I think theoretically out of a out of one cluster was 4.4 petabytes worth of data at this particular time because we're bound to the VSP cluster limits. Now, if I want an additional data store with a, in an additional cluster, um, then I can go right up to, I think the, the last count was a thousand um, hosts per vCenter uh, before I start running into more vCenters and all that. So it's kind of, it depends, but if, you, if you're getting to the point where you're running you know, 32 node clusters and you've got fully populated vSAN nodes and stuff like that, you've got a fair amount of, of, of data there. Um, and then you can just build another cluster on top. And to ask just the same question that I asked of Josh there, those, those numbers are obviously theoretical based on drive sizes and particular striping. Has that been tested so internally and validated? That, that 32 node cluster was built. Um, it wasn't built with the entire 4 terabyte drives. Um, so I think what was tested was essentially half of that. Um, but I guess theoretically when I think, who was it recently has released Six terabyte drives. Someone. So essentially, as you as you keep adding drive sizes um, and supporting drive sizes in the magnetic disk, then you start to look at capacity going up and up and up and up, sort of thing as well. And that's typically again for you know for colder data if you if you want or non you know, non flash uh, red data. Cheers. Um, our, our approach is a bit, you know, again a bit different as you probably expect from everybody else here. Um, so our platform is effectively a data store object in a box. So today we present a usable um, 33 and a half terabyte data store to the hypervisor. So in terms of scaling out, it's simply you want to you want more capacity. It's simply a case of adding another VM store as um, as a as a data store. So, so we don't have any like clustering or anything like that. We'll scale up nodes. It's simply a case of Add another capacity data stock. Now, across the course of this year, we'll be introducing um, new hardware platforms that will be a lot more capacity capability uh, on a data store basis. And that's how we look at the world. So, monster VM. So, another question. Yeah. Was that directed at me or is it? Yourself, yes. Okay. You, there you go. <laughs> this is a V mug, by the way, not a J mug. So we'll just point that out. <laughs> 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 oh, that's only if you ask Greg a good question. Oh, no, he no, gives no, it away. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, so look, Monster VMs really are limited for any storage vendor by the compute node that you run yes. on. So it's not really any different for any vendor. You run a compute node that's connected to either Nutanix or vSAN or Tintree or Pure, yeah. and you're limited by the RAM and the CPU in the box. So yeah, for Nutanix, our biggest nodes are 20 physical cores and 512 gig of RAM. So yeah, that's roughly your monster. So can, one VM cannot span across two nodes. No, so that's that's more of a VMware limitation, yeah, but that's yeah. yeah. And yeah. I would that's recommend not going to have anything to do with storage. Yeah. That's yeah, we can't no. hold the runtime literally. No. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you wouldn't want to do that anyway. That'd be scaling up too far, and you've heard my thoughts on scaling up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, next, Nick. Oh, would you rather I didn't ask? <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll make it a quick one, but it's uh, it's probably more for the the guys that are working with a distributed platform more than the sort of more traditional centralized, I guess. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, for uh, performance improvements, so the, the graph that you showed Josh had as you scale your environment up, your IOPS go up. Um, if we're talking about the monster VM use case from an IO perspective, uh, what, what is the, the unit of allocation? Are you, are you striping or is the, when you describe, described your blocks before, if we've got a, a, an object that's distributed amongst two nodes, is that object at the NDK or is it a particular chunk size? Uh, and can you adjust that in order to get more performance for, for a given monster VM as opposed to the, the whole aggregate environment? Sure. Okay, so what we do is we balance across our nodes in a one meg extent. So one meg IO is very big IO, it's very quick to send, it's low CPU overhead, so we move it to one meg. Um, when we write data, we write it on the first node and synchronously write it to another node. And then the next write might go on the, will go on the local node, but then will be distributed to another node. Okay, so yeah, one meg is how we balance. So a VM's size limit is the limit of the entire cluster. So you could have a monster VM from a capacity perspective that spanned 50 nodes, but only compute-wise ran on one. So you're not limited by but the nodes. From an I.O. perspective, a large yeah. disk could potentially be consuming objects from, from hundreds of different physical spindles. It could be, so the active data would be local. Um, the benefit of, let's say the monster VM has I.O. that's greater than the SSD capacity of one node, um, our SSD tier is actually shared. So if you run a benchmark on one VM, on one node, and then you improve or increase its active working set to multiple other nodes, you'll see the I.O. actually increase. So, yeah. Okay. Do you, you want, want to talk on that group? Do you want me to answer that? I think you know the answer. I know, I know the answer, but they don't. So, um, good question. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we do the same similar similar thing. We have objects which are which are, I guess, um, broken up depending on size and depending on the stripe width and things like that um, into chunk sizes, so one big chunk sizes. And as Nick was kind of alluding to in the in the leading question, um, we segment those over different disks right across the cluster. So if a VM has, let's say. Uh, a VMDK, which is an object which is broken up into a number of chunks, each of those chunks might leave some random place on some random disk anywhere across the cluster uh, there. So from an avail availability perspective, that gives us a very high amount of availability because we can sustain additional failures, sustain failures and still have the right amount of components to read information from. Um, but also from a performance perspective, we've got multiple areas and points and back-end disks to be able to read from as well. Um, just, just really a quick answer to that one. It, it's really a case of um, making sure there's enough available compute resource on our platform to run those VMs. Um, again, that's visible from our UI in terms of uh, what available resource you have on that system to, um, to run a particular um, workload. So you can actually assess that on an individual, uh, an individual VM store basis um, in your environment to actually, okay, where can I, where is the best place, where have I got the best resources to run a given VM on there as well. So there are, there are a whole bunch of things we're doing. There's a lot of stuff in the future in terms of uh, being able to manage multiple VM stores as a single object. Um, and managing those as a single object means we can effectively automate load balancing workload across, across different nodes. So that's something you'll see towards the end of this year. Early next year. Um, 
what would you say to uh, customers that are a bit hesitant with, with going with a startup? Like, is that a risk going with a startup storage company? Uh, absolutely. Um, I've never. <laughs> 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 um, startup technology, I guess, you might say. No comment. Yeah. I mean, oh, okay, so. You just got to trust it. No, no comment. No, no, I'm just saying. <laughs> you just got to trust it, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Oh look, I think we're all in kind of similar positions. We're all reasonably new companies. We've had, you know, venture capitalist funding. Um, you know, I guess you have to look at the technology, and you know, you do have to, I guess, take a bet on a newer company versus a, you know, an established company. So, I don't think there's a huge pro and con between any. Some of us have a bit more money in the bank, and some of us have a little bit less. But uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a huge risk. If the company's established and has good reference customers, um, so yeah, obviously I work for a startup. So single dad raising a three-year-old by myself. So if I thought it was risky, I wouldn't work for them. So I, I think just just to add to that, Joe, I think we all we all took risks. Yeah, we were all from yeah we're all from we all came from fairly large established vendors out there. Um, so it's. I guess you can kind of look at it. You, you've got to start from somewhere. The market's changing, and somebody has to somebody has to change that marketplace. And so, in, in terms of startup, I probably um, in, in most of our cases, it's uh, you know, all our organisations have been around for a number of years. So, whilst we may be new to this particular region, um, you know, shipping product for a number of years now. So, like we're on our you know third and fourth generation. Platforms. So again, it's you know, we've got to start from somewhere. So. Okay. I, I quite often hear that, especially uh, from from customers. Um, you know, you're a startup. You, you you're probably not going to be as mature as my uh, as my standard vendor. It's, it's a common question that, that I get. I hear it less and less um, as as time goes on, and, and, and we've got customers out there. Um, what I'm certainly seeing out there, and and um, is that. You know, the reason why I think you know where we are is is, is 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 it's about innovation, right? This whole flash area, the whole the way storage is going, it's really an innovative area. I think smaller companies that can move fast, can innovate fast, are the ones that that, that uh, are going to drive new features and and, uh, and and that's what I see all of us doing, right? We're very innovative. You're going to see new things, thinking differently about how you're going to use storage. Now, also, the other thing I thought is, you know, people say, oh, well, you're probably not as mature. I actually think in this whole world, this, I'm not going to, I feel that, that we're, I mean, Rob mentioned third generation product. We're in our fourth generation product, right? It is mature. And the other side is people argue about support. We actually try harder with support. Yeah. And that's why we get such high ratings. And I would say our support is the most awesome support I've ever worked with, right? Um, and I'll, I'll probably, at times, and some other vendors haven't been as, as, as favourable for it, but this support is awesome, right? Because we have to, because we have to prove ourselves. And that is what you're going to get, you know, taking on one of these organisations, is um, we're going to have to prove ourselves to you. Can I just, I do have a comment. Um, so, Fries. Uh, look, yeah, turn that on. <laughs> so, I mean, look, <laughs> exactly what these guys have said, I think, in, real, in reality, what I see from the customer side of it is that the customers are wanting innovation brought to them through the market. Um, and in, in a lot of cases, some of the, the big vendors, and I'll class VMware as a, as a big vendor because you know, not necessarily traditionally in the, in the storage market as we are now, but in the hypervisor market, in the cloud world and stuff, we are a, we are a, a, a fifth largest software uh, company in history. So. When I look at Tintree, when I look at Nutanix and Pura and all these guys um, that, that are around here at the moment for the customer base, because they're startups, they have a unique advantage. And one of those, one of that unique advantage above the fact that they can innovate very quickly is that all the rules don't apply. To VMware and to a lot of the other big storage vendors, there's a lot of customer base, there's a lot of rules that apply where we can't go to the market and say, you know what? We will give you a guarantee that the Pure will give you. We'll give you a price point that Tintry can give you. We can't do that. We can't move in that way. We'd like to, but we, we just can't do it. And what I see some of these guys really, really doing, and what I see you know, a lot of the startups going to customers is with a new set of rules and changing the game and making the, the other vendors, whether it's other storage vendors, whether it's hypervisor vendors or 
operating system, application vendors, whatever it is, backup vendors, having to react to that. And I think, in my, in my opinion, from what I see from the customer, they love that. And that's keeping the industry honest and it's keeping all of us in a job trying to chase our tail and make sure we're doing the right thing for the customer. So that's my answer. Okay, we just want more quick one. Thank you. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. Very good question. I was just going to say on our last point, the story about it's huge it. as well. So there's a lot of opportunity for startups and established players. So you know you might be looking at four storage solutions that are all wildly successful. So yes, we compete. Yes, we'll probably take some business off each other from time to time, but we'll probably all be very successful because the market's continually growing and there's more and more demand for virtualization and intelligent storage. So that's the other side of the coin. Cool. Next. One last question. Just a question for Josh, if I could. Um, do you see your company moving away from the hardware and just being able to supply that technology? I can see a great use for it in our DR site to, as the hardware propagates down, uh, grabbing three servers, refreshing some hard drives in them, not, not needing a SAN or large storage in the sure. DR. Um, maybe. <laughs> NDA? Is there NDA on your camera? <laughs> Maybe. No NDA. Yeah, so yeah, maybe you might see that pretty soon. <laughs> Just a question with, you know, like branch offices, how do these technologies work, you know, into branch offices that have got, you know, small environments that want to replicate into the, you know, the, into the how do they, all three of them, or four of them, do that sort of thing quite Let's easily? Let's go right yeah. to left or left to right. Yeah. Can, can we put some qualifiers on that? So are you, are you asking the question, obviously, do we replicate? everyone has replication capabilities but how halfway so their like box. Across, across WANs, how smart they are, you know, that sort of thing. You know, yeah. the data's bigger and bigger, we're replicating more across the WANs. Um, the pipes, you know, are not always guaranteed. Yeah. What sort of, what sort of... I think uh, the answer's the same from everyone. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, think I don't think anyone come up, can so. really give you a distinct answer on that. Um, it, without it depends on, yeah, distance, I mean, too much data. There, you know, there's, all the, all there's like change rates yeah. and, you know, we're all doing a form, you know, we're doing DG compression, which is also going to limit the amount of... It's changes, it's sending over like sending over your link. So it's um, I guess I don't want to say the famous it depends on but it, I think if you look at look at most of the replication technologies, you know, using flash and DG and all those capabilities, it makes it just more um, more efficient in terms of replication. Did you get all that? <laughs> Right. Anyone else? Or are we uh, all getting, 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 all getting